Great. So I'm going to start by introducing uh, to the listeners today what Empower is about in case you haven't um, read up deeply about them. So in my understanding, Empower is aiming to help African people get affordable housing. Um, but I think many people are misunderstanding what they do. They thought they are a construction company, but they're not. They are actually decentralized financing company. Well, not to be misunderstood with DeFi. They're helping African people um, with affordability. So they don't build the houses themselves, but I think they're using blockchain and decentralized finance um, by giving people affordable mortgage rates and so that they could actually buy the houses. So that's how I understand it to be. And there are a bit more nuanced information to this, like the people are not really directly buying, they are renting, but they're contributing to the rent until the entire amount of mortgage is paid off, then they would have full ownership of the houses. Does this make sense so far? Yeah, no, I think that's crystal clear. And, uh, thanks for the clarification. Okay, thanks for the feedback. And uh, another thing they try to do is to provide greener homes uh, for more African people, which is written on their mission statement. And that's something I'm very curious to know. Like, if they're not building things themselves, um, how can we sort of, you know, verify that homes are indeed greener? And how do we measure that the homes are greener? What kind of measurements are we using there? But that will be interesting to hear later. Another thing I want to know is, why do we need decentralized financing for this? Because um, real estate seems like a very centralized, traditional kind of industry. How is decentralized system helping there? And that's something I want to know. It looks like Miggy is back. Let's hear what he has to say. Welcome back, Miggy. Hey, uh yeah, I tried to get in contact with uh, Greg, but I think Glenn is also going to be joining us and he'll be here any any minute now. So, yeah, I can, uh, you know, cover it, cover it for him until he, until he gets here. So any questions for now, okay. I, I'll be happy to cover. Perfect. Merman, I do realize you have your hand up. Um, but as I said, the format is that I will be asking some basic questions. If it's not urgent, I would ask you to wait until we're done with the basic questions and then we will get to you. Would that be all right with you, Merman? Perfect. Miggy, so let's kickstart this then. I do have my basic question. Uh, can you fill, fill in for the audience very simply? How does Empower work? Maybe the business model? Yeah, sure. I can give like a uh, quite... Uh, try and make it quite brief because it is quite complicated and there's a lot of uh, nuances to it and I do direct people to like the white paper and uh, that stuff if they want to get more details but I'll, I'll do my best so essentially what Empower is trying to do is trying to bridge the gap for affordable housing finance in Africa with uh, essentially the cryptocurrency market and the real estate the real uh, the retail investors should I say who are interested in this real estate market and uh, essentially what they're trying to do uh, was kind of, yeah, really around the, the term empower. So give people the power to have their own homes and, you know, kind of get on the financial ladder and, you know, become financially independent and, you know, financially empowered through housing. And this is currently like not a sustainable model. So at the moment, people who are looking for, you know, affordable homes in Africa, so people on lower incomes, they have to pay very exorbitant rates so like anything from 18 percent up to like 45 percent in Zimbabwe and this is something that you know uh Glenn who's the founder he saw it as like a major issue and a major roadblock for people to you know become financially you know stable and you know be able to provide for themselves and I feel like yeah that's kind of like the the basis of it is trying to provide a more affordable loan to the people who are trying to access uh, housing in Africa and this model is uh, using NFTs and DeFi like, kind of like you mentioned before Dumplin and uh, yeah 
that's kind of like a brief overview of what we're trying to achieve. But obviously, there's a lot of, you know, different nuances within that. So stable coins is something that we're trying to implement, which is going to support this whole process. And that's built into the, you know, the, the processes of the NFTs and the smart contracts and all of that. So it's something that's still being worked on. But it's, yeah, the, the idea is already there. And it's already, uh, it's already been tested with the Catalyst Homes. So funding can get there and can be created but we got oh we got empower here so maybe uh you can also add on to that <laughs> thank you miggy welcome empower i believe is greg and glenn on the team thank you for joining uh, could you expand and add a little bit a ba- building on miggy's point we're eager to hear about uh, the basic business model and the underlying logic of empower yeah hi Dumplin. it's a uh... Greg here. Um, I head up operations at Empower. Sorry for joining the call a bit late. We had some technical issues and I know Glenn's joined in as well. Um, I did get the end of what uh, Bruno was uh, was sharing. It. He's a you know, well-established member of the team, so I'm sure he was touching on a lot of the a lot of the things that we would we would cover anyway. Um, I don't know. It sounded like Bruno, you did a good job of covering kind of the core of how the business would work maybe is there anything in particular you'd like me to expand on yes so i'm very curious about why do you need decentralized blockchain to achieve what you want to do yeah i think that's a a great question so i think there's a really two components to where blockchain adds value in, in what we're trying to achieve the first, and I think kind of most notable, is around getting the finance that we raise from. Sorry about that. Getting the finance that we raise from the markets, the developed markets, so euros, pounds, dollars, etc., into the hands of the developers on the ground. Who, who need to build out these projects. And um, to give an example of, of how that's been a challenge, uh, the Catalyst Homes we funded, at the same time, some other houses in that development were funded by a large NGO who had to send money in the more traditional way. And that money was held by the central bank for six months. Uh, and for six months, the money was just out of circulation and wasn't able to be used on the ground uh, for developing the houses. Quite frustratingly, actually, people within the development company had to be laid off because there just wasn't money to pay their salaries. So I think being able to more freely and easily move the money um, from where it's raised to where it's needed is a re- immediately, in, in, in a transparent way, um, is a, immediately a benefit for using the blockchain. I think from the DeFi perspective, uh, again, uh, there's some interesting opportunities by using it a decentralized way of raising finance. So I think what's been shown to be the challenge when trying to raise money for projects building within the African continent, and I can speak to this from my own experience, I'm South African originally, um, is that, you know, uh, parties who are raising the financing, uh, they often a centralized body who controls, who has a, a huge amount of power within that transaction, and as a result, they, um, you know, are got a lot of options, right? They're uh, normally a big NGO, a big property fund. Um, and anything that you're trying to do within Africa, especially within the impact space, is now also competing with other projects that, you know, uh, shopping center in Berlin, which is obviously far less risky on face value. And as a result, uh, you know, a better return relative to the risk that you're taking on. And so because of this uh, uneven power dynamic, what's happening is, and, and in order to compensate for the risk, you know, we get into these really high interest rates. So we believe that by using DeFi and, and putting the kind of challenge of raising this money, as well as the opportunity it presents into the hands of far more people, we're able to raise capital at a rate that's more fair. We're able to reward a bigger group of people. We're also about able to tap into those community members, those Kodana community members, who, of course, want to return. We are a for-profit business who are planning to give a return to anyone who helps fund our projects. 
but at the same time, you also want to make an impact with that money. So our thesis is that everyone will have a portfolio and some of that portfolio will be really profit focused exclusively. But some amount of the money that's uh, allocated, you'll want to know is, yes, producing a return, but it's also making a positive impact and, you know, uh, leaving the world better with that money that you're spending. So we think a combination of actually being able to get the money into the into the markets, as well as being able to reach out to a broader audience who maybe shares that motivation um, is the value of blockchain and of DeFi. Thank you, Glenn, for clarifying. I think if I understood you correctly, there are a few things that you value in decentralization, especially in Cardano, like the transparency of the blockchain, the fair way of raising funds for your project, and also Cardano's African focus which enables you and Cardano to share the same mission is very much the, the vision that our community has. So thank you for sharing that. I do see uh, that my co-host, oh, sorry. Yeah, I actually, I think I'll run to add one more thing. And that is that the long-term plan of Empower is to really decentralize our project to the point where it is not us who's choosing the development. It's not us who's choosing the developer, but rather it is a marketplace where people who are trying to, raise money for an impact property development, be it in Africa or potentially be it elsewhere, are able to connect with artists producing the, who could produce the NFT and put that together and put that out to the market and have the projects that make the most sense from a financial perspective and from an impact perspective be funded. And I think uh, decentralization, crypto in general, that really enables that, right? It enables you to really connect the best projects with the best people and the funding that resonates with, with those people. So I think, yeah, maybe just to add to that, I mean, the long-term ambitions aren't for this to be a centralized, empowered decides what gets financed. But of course, we have a lot of lessons to learn. So being able to control certain variables, like who the property developer is, initially helps a huge amount in learning some key things. Thank you for clarifying and adding that. Carano for 20, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank Dumpling. Thank you, Dumpling. Um, I I'm curious. In the white paper, you you speak about um, how tenants of rental units are the are. I have it here. It says the cornerstone of the Impala ecosystem, and will be recognized and rewarded for this. I'm just curious if if um, you could maybe just uh, give us an overview of how tenants could be participating in this wealth creation and and benefit from it. Yeah, so look, I, I mean, I think the, the the obvious benefit to any tenant is the ability to secure a home and um, to secure a home at an, aff with, you know, an affordable interest rate. I mean, I think uh, for most people on this call, maybe if you're fortunate enough to own a property, it is probably your biggest asset. So, uh, and, you know, and, and for maybe some of us on this call, we've been able to secure that asset with financing whilst living in it and enjoying the benefit of living that ho in that home. And of course, paying an interest rate for one that is reasonable and one that can be serviced without you know, putting you into a huge amounts of debt. So I think, of course, the a big value add to any tenant within the, within the space is that they'll get in a home that they, can that they will ultimately own it because it's a, a lease to rent model. Um, so they will ultimately own and that becomes a big asset for them, which of course, you know, fundamentally changes, changes who they are or they you know, changes their financial position. Um, I think in addition to that, you know, we're trying to also benefit tenants in other ways. So, you know, we're talking to, to providers about trying to increase connectivity in our homes. So not only will they have a home, but they'll be better connected, which I think, you know, is well documented that better internet connectivity, you know, has positive outcomes to your income, your ability to generate income. And then I think we're also trying to be far more sustainable how we build these homes. And I'll be honest with you that our customers, region, current customers in Mozambique, when they find out our homes are sustainable, what's motivating them to choose our homes over others uh, is not that it's sustainable and it's good for the planet. I think at the economic level that they're coming in, that's not their biggest concern. But what they really do like is the savings on their utilities each month. So each month they're net better off by not having to spend as much on on um, electricity and water. And so I think, you know, 
that's great because that's the motivator for them to choose a, a sustainable home. But of course, it's got the, the overall benefit of being better for the environment. So I think if we say, how does a tenant benefit? Well, the tenant will benefit, of course, by getting a, an affordable home that they then own. If our plans go through, the ability to you know be connected, but also just to have a home that is cheaper to live in, um, so better quality, cheaper to live in, and of course, something that they will ultimately own. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. I have a question about building greener homes. Um, yeah. So first of all, what is meant by that? And then secondly, how do you measure and ensure that? Because as I understood, you don't actually build it yourselves. You have local partners. Uh, so how do you ensure that they're being truthful on the green data that they're giving you? Yeah, ab absolutely. So look, it's true that we our intention is not to be the property developer ourselves and rather to partner with people on the ground. I think that already removes a lot of complexity in the challenge of actually building homes. Having said that, you know, we've subscribed to the EDGE metric or EDGE standard for evaluating buildings, which I think is a globally recognized standard. And we also appreciate that not in every market will every home be as sustainable as we would like. So, you know, what will be clear in the impact cards that we sell to finance projects is how sustainable we're expecting that development to be. And then of course, depending on your or an, uh, an individual's preference, they can then choose to, you know, finance projects that are more sustainable or less, you know, or less sustainable. It will always be the case that we will try and do kind of at least the bare minimum, you know, solar panels, if need be water treatment uh, facilities. But during Catalyst, we also bought CO2 negative homes. So homes that were made out of sustainable wood and actually, you know, were the height of what you would consider as sustainable. How we ensure that is, I suppose, the same way that we'll have to ensure any other building that we, that we do is with, we will need to have some on the ground people. And um, this is a real fire project after all. And those people will need to, you know, go and verify some of the kind of basic things that have been promised uh, within the the proposal for funding. So checking that the it's buildings up to standard, that the development's done, you know, with the sustainability uh, promises that that again were applied for when they applied for the funding. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that's going to be also critical when we say choosing trusted partners. That is why we're choosing right now to roll out one pilot project or at least in one pilot area in Mozambique with Casa Real. And then as we grow again to try and use only trusted partners, maybe that we have vetted. But whilst we're doing that, we're trying to learn how could you how could this go at scale? So how could we vet a project without, you know, knowing the developer intimately as we do right now. So I think that the exact way we're going to confirm that is of course part of what's to be decided. But I can tell you it will require, at least in, in most cases, and at least initially, some on-the-ground presence, um, which could be a, a third-party contractor, for example. It doesn't have to be an empowered person flown out. Uh, it could be a, you know, a, a third-party adjudicator who goes in and confirms that it's done as, as, was, as was suggested. Thank you. I suppose like if you actually use the blockchain, the transparency of the data there, maybe you can just put your green data there so that it's already always verifiable. So it's very hard to cheat the system. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, you know, kind of transparency of the blockchain is, is something that, you know, has you know, is a big draw card to, to use in this, uh, a blockchain like Adana and just going about it in this way. I mean, being able to see how the funds have flown, Will of course be valuable but we're even looking at you know other kinds of data that we could house within within uh, uh, something like an nft or within something like a digital identity you know one of the big challenges that people moving through moving around the continent of africa have is you know as soon as you move and maybe for those of us who've moved from one country to another you lose a huge track record you know uh, credit scores obviously disappear but even simple things like the fact that you were a really good tenant and you know paid your your rental income on time is something that's completely lost. And now you move to another country, and uh, a landlord's dependent on where you've moved, may view you with suspicion, 
people may just not feel as comfortable leasing to you as they would to somebody locally. So, I mean, a big part of what we're going to look to do is to try and also digitize some of that identity and be able to move that, bring bring that with you so it becomes a an immutable record of your successfully paying uh, your home loan or paying your rental income. I think there's a chance that property uh, developments might have some that are leased to own and some might just have rent-controlled apartments depending on the project. But simply having that captured, and again, with a smart contract, you have the ability to really make that and something that's automated and something that's verifiable. If your rental in, you pay your rent on time or you pay your, uh, your lease or your mortgage payment on time, that's recorded. That automatically adds to your the score on your digital identity, and it's something that anyone can reference. And of course, at the same time, if you don't make your payment, that can also be recorded, and that can again be an incentive to make sure that you continue to make your payments. Thank you for clarifying that, Glenn. I do have a question about affordable housing. It is still a very abstract term when you say affordable or more affordable. So how much more affordable? Can you provide maybe some figures, examples, or even stories? So, I mean, we can. Uh... I think uh, in all ca- in some cases, our homes will be, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at affordable. So in some cases, you know, the, the product that we've built might be slightly more expensive in a monthly contribution, but then you might say that in your utility bill, for example, being more sustainable, as an example. And right now, what I, what I, what we're targeting is, interest rates that will be say in the single digits you know versus as we mentioned and i think as bruno mentioned when he was doing his intro where we're in markets where it could be 30 40 percent plus so you know that's immediately you know 20 percent, 30 percent plus saved in interest rate annually um in your lease to lease to own model so that would be a, a pretty big saving uh for anybody who looked to take one of our homes as far as if we or if or when we go down projects that are going to be rent controlled, it really will depend on the market in question. So um, it's hard to say for now, but I can tell you that, uh, and actually it would be for, it would be nice if Maria Deal, who's often on these uh, on these AMAs, I don't think is on on this one. Uh, she's from Casarel, who's our on the ground partner. She can give you some really hard like hard metrics, but I can tell you that we're targeting and we believe we can successfully target interest rates that will be in the single digits, um, which is probably more in line with what you'd see in countries like South Africa. Uh, well, actually, no, that would even be optimistic for South Africa versus, say, uh, you know, a 30 or 40% within within Mozambique. Um, but our first homes, the homes that we did within Catalyst, what is really worth noting is uh, those homes were done with the Catalyst funding, right? So there was no expectation, there is no expectation of a return to any investor. So we're able to be much more generous there in terms of just being able to do a proof of concept uh, to show that we could build the houses, to show that there was an appetite for the kinds of houses we were looking to build. Um, and therefore we're less concerned about the return. But of course, when we come to launch our impact cards and having people purchase to fund projects, then we'll need to be much more careful about the rate of return. Because like I've said, this is not a charity. This is a for-profit business where we, we plan to produce a return. And so I think at, at that part of what we're trying to do now is understand what is the building cost, what is an affordable rate of interest, and also test that with the market in terms of what is the kind of return that that uh, NFT holder would want. And we are the NFT team are playing with a lot of different concepts. Some might see uh, different tiered NFTs potentially, so some that are way more focused as well might be a little bit more expensive to acquire, but way more focused on the return you get. And then there may be other versions of the NFT for the same project that are focused more on the social impact, but might reduce, might have a lower rate of return, but also might be cheaper to acquire. And so I think playing with that concept will also allow us to unlock more capital and unlock capital at a rate that makes sense for the person who lands up ultimately purchasing the NFT. So if it's really about making the highest return, so be it. There'll be an opportunity for you to to per, to fund the project, but that might be a bit more expensive as in terms of the NFT itself. And if for you this is much more of a I want to finance a a home, but I also want to make an impact, 
then that will be an option for you and that might still produce a return but one that is lower but you know you may get an artwork you may get other stuff linked to it as well Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I do realize we have hands up and we have some people eager to speak. Just want to clarify that we will get to you. Uh, thank you for your uh, patience in advance. I'll just go through my questions and then we'll go to, through your questions as well. So, Glenn, my other question is, are there specifically targeted countries in the beginning? Uh, because as I understand, not all African countries are the same in terms of po politics, regulations, economy, and stuff like that. You mentioned Zimbabwe, I believe, or Mozambique. So can you expand a little bit uh, why did you select those countries and what are the plans for the near future? Absolutely. So you're right. I mean, South Africa is a, a large continent with 50 plus countries, all of which are unique and different and have their own set of rules and regulations. Our pilot project right now is 100% uh, in Mozambique, um, with, uh, and that was in part chosen because of the desperate need. Mozambique is a country of 13 million people and only has 600 mortgages. So just to repeat that, because it might be a ridiculous number, but it is absolutely the truth, 13 million people live within Mozambique and only 600 people have a home loan. And so that speaks to a huge untapped potential and a huge, uh, huge market that, uh, for, for what we're trying to do. Um, we also have a really trusted partner in Casa Real, so we really ticked the box there, and we had a, a, a project and a piece of land in, by, in Vera, which again really fit the bill um, and was open to impact and affordable housing. So that seemed like a good test case, and so we will obviously learn some lessons during this development in Mozambique, and we'll probably continue to do more developments there. Um, because one simply one develop uh, one project will will not even begin to to scratch the surface of the opportunity there. As far as follow up countries, um, Glenn is originally Zimbabwean. Um, he's recently moved to South Africa before moving to the Netherlands. I'm uh, also South African. Also moved to the Netherlands recently. There's some good connections there, so that will be a, another market we're going to explore. Um, I think that kind of sub. Saharan or Southern Africa uh, is probably where we will start. So you've got your Namibias, your Zambias, your Mozambiques, Zimbabwe, South Africa. In all those cases, whilst that region is very diverse, at least it's a region that we can focus on. It's a region where many of the team have some experience, either haven't lived there or, uh, or have been worked there in the past. And hopefully we can also demonstrate to the the NGOs, the governments, the kind of more traditional space, uh, traditional players in that space, what we were able to achieve, and then that we get further support. So I think that would be our area of focus for now. But uh, again, I think if you were to say our plan is within the course of 2022 to release our projects in Mozambique, and I think at least one, potentially two other countries. So uh, starting off relatively small, but also being realistic that, you know, rolling this out to 30, 40, 50 countries in, in a single year is, is with all those other southern East Carolina, is probably not realistic. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I do like to move on, actually, to Eric from SCATDAO. Uh, he's been having great questions regarding Empower. Before I do that, I do want to remind the listeners that you're welcome to raise your hands, ask questions. Alternatively, if you do not want to speak, see the pinned tweet above. You can join the space Discord and type your questions. Me and my co-host, we will take care of that and ask on your behalf. With that said, let's welcome Eric from Skedal. Eric, what do you have for us? Hey, thanks, Tom Um So yeah, I was reading the white paper yesterday. And when I was reading it, it was kind of unclear whether the people that were providing the funding, it was to, you know, kind of help people out or if it was to, to make a profit off of it. So when you were just clarifying, you were kind of saying that it's it, it's both, that there's people that could donate money because they, they want help and that there's people that, you know, would, would do it to make a profit. Is, is that correct? Uh, thanks for the question. And I think it's an important point to clarify. So I we kind of talk about the, the three Ps that empower us talk profit, people, and planets. And we don't believe that you can't optimize for all three. To be very clear, Empower is a for-profit business. 
that is looking to really unlock the potential that is the housing market within Africa, but do it in a way that can be profitable, but can still make a positive impact on the people and not make a negative impact on the planet. So trying to balance those three. The impact cards, which is which are the NFT. Hello? Am I, am I being wrong? Uh, oh, no, okay. no. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you, you cut out there. Um, we can't hear you. Maybe I can just try to cover for Greg a little bit. So I think um, maybe what you got a little bit confused was Greg was talking about like um, there could be. So each project will be funded by like a specific NFT collection that will be representing that project. Now, the NFT that you might get for, from a collection, it doesn't give you part ownership, but it, it gives you like part returns. So uh, ownership of the returns from that project. So typically there will be for profit these, uh, these projects, but I guess there could be you know, a specific case where maybe something is made, which is just not getting a, a particularly big return, but is maybe a more, you know, righteous cause. I don't know what that could be. Maybe building a water well that, you know, that can't get a return. You know, it's something that's just everyone's going to be able to use and it's kind of like a free service. And maybe that could be an NFT that's divided into a couple of people and someone wants to invest in that. And it's just like a, a an impact cause and it's just trying to help the community out or whatever that, that may be, uh, then that could be a possibility. The platform could, you know, open itself up to that, but primarily it is a for-profit uh, project that we're going to be partnering with. So Casa Real is a for-profit business, and they're the first partners in Mozambique. And, yeah, so whatever we do, as, I mean, primarily in the beginning, is going to be, a, yeah, looking for a return, obviously a more affordable interest rate than what's available at the moment to the people on the ground. But yeah, it's still a return for the investors that, you know, like that you and me. Great. Th thank you for uh, clarifying that. So so if it is for profit, and like in the white paper, it was referencing Zimbabwe quite a bit. So if you have countries that have 200% inflation, how is it possible to offer an interest rate that's in the single digits when you're dealing with hyperinflation that would just, you know, it... it, it it's really, like impossible to offer an interest rate that that's low if it's lower than the rate of inflation, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So sorry about that. First of all, apologies. I don't know. My Twitter space has just restarted. I suppose this happens. But and I think what Bruno touched on is, is correct. Uh, to be to be clear, when I mentioned uh, the return, it was not for Zimbabwe. It was Mozambique, and of course we have to tackle that on a on a case by case basis. So the financial situation in you know across the continent is very 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 different. I mean, I can tell you that. My home loan in South Africa is a place that I think 11%, uh, no, sorry, 7, 7 or 8%, um, which is, you know, okay, I suppose, uh, kind of there or thereabouts. But um, it's obviously much higher than, say, in, in Europe, where it would be, say, 1.5%. So for me being able to get a, a home loan at the same rate that I could get one here in the Netherlands, at 1 or 2% would be obviously game changer. But at the same time, that might not be the problem that needs to be solved there. Uh, in a in a city like Cape Town, where I'm from, uh, the legacy of apartheid means that people are spread throughout the country, uh, or, or people are only slightly uh, persecuted people um, were forced to live outside of the city, and therefore it's very hard, very expensive for people now to live near the city. And maybe the challenge we really have to solve there is a more is development within control. So. That might be a very different market where you're buying to a project that has been built to to have rent control departments close to the city, uh, and so that would be a completely different business model. In Zimbabwe, I agree with you 100% that it would not be realistic to do an interest rate as low as what was mentioned for the Mozambique project because the environment is completely different. The interest rates, as you mentioned, or the inflation is much higher. It's yeah, the economics obviously have to make sense. And so that's why I think, in part, we focused on one country and gave them our product and our offering right, and that's the product and offering to the person purchasing the home and also to the person funding the home. I think when we get to Zimbabwe, it might be the case that interest rate is substantially higher, but still, for that market, 
is a, a good offering. Or it might be the case that by right now, when we look at Zimbabwe and we crunch numbers, we realize we can't right now in a profitable way uh, service that market, and so we may have to look somewhere else. So uh, please don't think that the product that we offer or the return that we offer is therefore standardized across every African country or every development, etc. It will need to be on a case by case basis, and there will be some trial and error. So what is attractive to to investors, to people financing the project? Uh, what is the interest rate that needs to be? What is some of the other value adds we can have? Is there rarity? Is there a bigger social impact? Is there, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, Glenn talks a lot about creating NFTs that are, uh, that create value that's not extractive to the people on the ground. So how can we, through our NFT, do stuff that makes it valuable to the the person who purchases it without actually having to necessarily jack up the interest rate. As mentioned, there might be artwork, there might be rarity, there might be stories that we communicate through the NFT, um, and those things we'll have to test and see which do work and which don't, and hopefully in that way we can create value for the holder, but not also jack up the interest rate. I don't know, does that... Yeah, I think you might have cut out again, but yeah, in, in general, so I guess it would be fair to say that there's many markets that will never be able to, to get to single-digit interest rates, right? Did, did I get cut up? He may have. No, he may have gotten uh, rugged again. Seems like he uh, he, he did. Maybe I think. Would you um, like to take this one? Yeah, I'll try to tackle it. So I think it's kind of um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a a struggle to answer directly because obviously the markets you know in Africa are ever changing and you know things can happen, you know, on a day by day basis that completely change, you know, what even the inflation numbers can be and all of these type of things. But I think it's important to look at it like in the future i hope for the, hopefully zimbabwe rates do, or the whole of african rates do start to go down so i think appropriately whatever empower is offering would need to you know stay competitive so I, I would imagine that you know hoping that the market in africa gets better then yeah hopefully then the empower rates will be you know even better than that and hopefully getting to single digits in, even in certain markets where that's kind of unimaginable unimaginable right now considering the you know, high inflation, volatility, risk of the local currency. Cool. Thanks a lot. I, I, I have other questions, but I'll give someone else a, a chance to talk, Dumpling. Thank you, Eric. We'll come back to you later. And I do realize we have AOK BH Pool. He's been here for a while. Uh, thank you for your patience. What kind of questions do you have? Yes, hi. Thanks uh, for hosting this. Uh, thanks for, Paul for answering all the questions. It's a nice project. Uh, I'm also from Netherlands, so um, uh, just just as a side note, um, I was wondering about like how do you manage the currency risk? Because I think we heard about inflation, and partly that reflected the currency risk, currency devaluation. So how do you actually take care of that? Because initially you fund some project, and um, then the rental returns that you get are in the local currency, right? And that continues to devalue, or how do you take care of that in the rental, uh, let's say, revaluation every year? Do you actually do a, a, let's say, correction of inflation every year for the rentals? How does it work? Uh, so I'll jump in here. Uh, so that's part of the, the challenge with the EMP token. So people often ask, why do we have an NFT and an EMP uh, and a utility token and the NFTs? The funding and the return in the EMP token is providing that utility to be able to move the funds. Um, that EMP, the the uh, the the rate of EMP return. Uh, uh, there's a, a video on our website, which actually maybe Bruno, if you want to re retweet and then share on this channel, it might help people to be able to visualize it a bit better. Um, but uh, that is going to be part of of the challenge that we need to face. So. In part, it's going to be requiring stable coins, but at the same time, we're going to need to lock in a smart contract that is able to get the fiat in um, and returned to the investor and do that at a rate that can, to some extent, control for the, the currency fluctuation. So 
it is true that that is a, a challenge within the project, right, is being able to um, give a return that accounts for any risk to risk to the currency. And uh, we're going to be trying to do that through smart contracts. Again, the it is a known challenge for the project that we're going to need to find a way to create stable coins in some of these markets. So some of the markets, obviously the US dollar is, is well traded and in other markets in Southern Africa, the South African Rand, which already does have a stable coin can be used. But um, part of what we're trying to, to tackle right now and actually, you know, is something that we will need to reach out to our community, especially those that are more financially minded to, to weigh in on is how do we control both for inflation and for currency whilst producing a return that that makes sense for the investor and obviously for the person on the ground. So um, yeah, it's it's I'm probably not the, the clearest answer that you are looking for, but um, it is something that we're we're well aware of and something we're going to be trying to tackle with the empower empower token and the utility contract. And I think our our video that is uh, hopefully Bruno will share into the chat or at least you can see on our website and our, our tokenomics will can also give a little bit more detail showing you how that flow would work. No, I can understand that 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 you'll try to basically this kind of commodity hedging, right? When commodities are also traded, you basically could provide a let's say a currency hedge. So in this case, because if the interest rates are high, it's high for a reason there, right? Um, uh, it, it's it's not like 20-30% can just come out of the blue, right? Uh, so it's it's basically cross-currency uh, risk hedging. So in the end, the US dollar return that investors get from the NFT, if they invest in the NFT, right? Um, it would be kind of compensating for that, right? So you'll, you'll, so if, if there's a house, house price appreciation and at the same time currency devaluation in the same year, for example, right? Yeah. So if the house price appreciates say by 10% and the currency devaluates by 20%, for example, right? Worst case yeah. fluctuations. Um, then essentially, how will you get the return? Where will you get the money to give it back to the investors? That's my basic question. Hello? Yes, Mickey, we can hear you. Okay, maybe I can chime in here. Um, so I guess the idea is that the, the interest rate that we are providing to so the investors, the people that want to invest in an individual project, uh, that interest rate or that APY, whatever you want to call it, that will be an EMP token. So it won't be in US dollar denominated. So I guess that kind of what the, um, how we're trying to solve that kind of uh, that, that issue that exactly you're talking about, so the, the high inflation rates within these local currencies and how we can try to eliminate kind of the the risk for the investor. So kind of the idea that's described in the video, which I'm trying to find, I, I thought there was a tweet, but there's been so many tweets on the Empower uh, Twitter recently, but the video kind of describes that kind of scenario, which isn't, I mean, it's not a, it's a, um, it's a description of what it's going to look like, but there isn't like a smart contract already that does that, that, that has that function, which is kind of what we are trying to do and trying to develop with Empower. So yeah, that's why we have the MVP planned for Q3, I believe, of this year. And there's, you know, going to be other NFT projects that continue to test this idea and, you know, we'll kind of experiment and see if we can find exactly that, that model that we're talking about, which is that's going to eliminate that risk for the investor. And I hope See, the point of is, so I think you're talking about something like some kind of staking reward in order to offset something, right? Because money has to come from somewhere. So if something reduces and you're going to give back the investors, it can, doesn't come out of the blue. So if you say that Empower Token, it means that the scarcity of the Empower Token enables higher valuation and you give some kind of staking rewards for the NFTs uh, back to the investors in order to compensate for their risk. That's in kind of very simple terms. That's how I see it, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So sorry, guys. I don't know why I suppose we have these law that that out at least for me as well. My phone is basically crashing. I'm sorry. I'm dropping out of the call. Maybe if you want to repeat the last sentence or two, and I'm really sorry for everyone on the call. I know the same thing has happened to Glenn. Um, then I can try and confirm if what you're suggesting is is in fact correct. Yeah. 
Hello, KB Hedgepool. Do you care to repeat your question? I think. Yeah, yeah. So, what, what I was just telling is like, if you take that simple example that house price appreciates, let's say, by 10%, the capex appreciates 10%, rental return is around, say, 4 or 5%. So, so 10 plus 5, 515. And suddenly there's a devaluation of the currency, say, by around 20% that year, right? You're not, no, no way you're going to get the money back which you've invested for that year, the return, right? So the only way to compensate, what I'm trying to tell is that the Empower tokens, which are there, uh, sort of utility tokens, because the scarcity in the market uh, trading, you gain some value and you give that value back to the investor in some form of staking returns or something similar. So that's how I see the compensation. Otherwise, I don't see in simple terms how this compensation actually occurs. Yeah. In this simple use case. So, so, so it is true that, of course, there could be appreciation in the value of the EMP, right? And so part of what smart contracts can just to do is to, as you say, act to lock in the EMP return. And, you know, as you know about economics, there's 200 million EMP that will be ultimately be in circulation, but the vast majority of that, about 160 million of that, is going to be Is it me or is he dropping out? Dropping out. It's a cr chronic rugging. Oof. Miggy, do you mind stepping in and answer? Yes, I will. Unfortunately, uh, it's not being very friendly to my colleagues. So, unfortunately, I'll try to take over for, the, for him. Um, so, yeah, what he's talking about is um, the tokenomics of uh, the MPA token and uh, vast majority. So, I think it's about 60%, if I'm not mistaken. So, 120 million tokens which are reserved for housing supply. So essentially those will be released as essentially uh, EMP tokens are accumulated by NFT holders. So people who have invested in an, um, an impact card, they will be getting a return. And part of that return will be coming from this, uh, this is like pool. So this is they're going to be distributed uh, you know, along five years, I think it is. That's like the period that it's going to be released on. So that's going to be, you know, through different projects. And that's kind of going to be part of the return. So it's going to help uh, kind of that process. But yeah, I don't know where, uh, what else uh, Greg was going to say. But uh, I, I don't think, uh, like you were saying, it's not, it's what you were saying regarding staking re rewards. It's not going to be used. Yeah, that's not where the income is going to be coming from. So I think what Greg might have been trying to touch on is the locked in uh, exchange rate. So let's say uh, when a, EMP, you have a thousand EMP that you spend on an NFT and this a thousand EMP is then transferred, you know, into a sm smart contract, which is a smart contract for that policy ID. So all of the, pro all of the NFTs related to this exact project and is to exactly lock in that uh, exchange rate at the time. So if it's, you know, let's say uh, 10 Mozambique and uh, Metakaj to one EMP, that's going to be locked in for the 10-year period, at least until the original investment is returned. So regarding the APY after that, so the, the, the interest, that's kind of to be defined. So that could be coming from the housing supply, or it could, could have to come from the open market, depending on the circumstances. But obviously, that's still being defined, like we've been saying. But uh, hopefully, that kind of clears it up a little bit. So there's a locked-in exchange rate, and there's also the housing supply from the tokenomics that can be tapped into and it's the intention of it is to tap in, is to be tapped into when these housing uh, projects start being built. I hope that kind of clears it up a little bit, but obviously this is all going to be, you know, like released to the community and the debate is within the community. Scott Dow, did you have a, another question? Yeah, kind of following up on what you're just saying, Miggy. So like, if you have a locked in exchange rate at the beginning, but like the people that are paying back these mortgages or paying for their housing, they're not paid in EMP, they're paid in the local currency, and that local currency is constantly changing and fluctuating. So like even if you lock in a a, a ratio at the beginning for EMP to, you know, whatever the local currency is, if they're getting paid throughout, you know, the 20 year period that they're re repaying the loan and there's, you know, massive currency devaluation, how does that work? Like if they're paying back their loans, it, it, they still have to convert their local currency into the token if they're going to pay it back. Right. So like how how how, how would that work? So exactly, they, they won't be personally. Uh, maybe Greg's back. I don't know if you want to answer. Maybe you're doing better on this account. Yeah, sorry guys. Try on this account. Um, so so yes, there's a uh, the look. I think I think there's obviously. Uh, 
and I'm really, I'm so, I really, really am sorry that this has been such a disjointed conversation because it's a really valuable one. But um, what I can tell you, maybe to 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 try and uh, address the currency concern is 100 percent the currency and interest rates, etc., are something that needs to be addressed. I think we've tried to address it with looking at how we can use the utility token. I think we've tried to address it with, insu- with hedging and insurance, but it's absolutely not something that I think we've completely uh, solved and something that we're working to solve. And so I think it's something that we are currently, as with a lot of this project, are seeking counsel on. And we have some, some pretty smart people from the more traditional banking sector trying to help us think about how we can better leverage and hedge ourselves against against this. But it will be uh, an element that we'll need to have A, clarified, and be an, an uh, element of risk in holding and empower impact card and something that you would need to account for both in when you consider purchasing one, the return, both how that's, what that's going to be in percentage terms, the currency in question, and then any other other value adds that will be included with the NFT, whether you believe that that compensates for that risk. And of course, it will depend on, and then, and, and then of course, the impact that you're making, which is, is, is what's going to draw some people to the project. And that kind of combination of trifecta of things is what will either make it an attractive investment opportunity or not, depending on the individual. Got it. Th- thank you, Greg. You know, I, I appreciate the the candor. And, you know, to, to me, I don't know is always an acceptable answer. Yeah. You know, if something's not quite figured out or sure. something, you know, th- doesn't quite make sense. It's always OK to say, I don't know, instead of, you know, just kind of talking around. No, no, of course. Uh, absolutely. And look, I think one of the things uh, if you if you hear the, the power team speak and it's it's the reality of the project we're trying to we're trying to tackle this is a, a huge problem right and it's one that's systemic it's been around and it's been around for you know forever and so you know to think that we have all the answers solved here today you know with uh, two weeks out from a token uh, a token sale and uh, a whole you know roadmap that needs to be executed on if we sat here and said we had everything solved and sorted, I think there would probably be a bigger red flag. So, we you know, we can only give you a window into our thinking and and maybe also put people's mind at ease that we know that these things are problems that need to be solved. But at the same time, 100%, there's stuff that we just do not know yet. And there's probably stuff we don't know that we don't know. But uh, that's why we our kind of tagline is join the journey uh, because we do see it as a, as a journey to come into a, a solution for all these things. And yeah, some of it will hit the mark and some of it won't, but hopefully we get it right more than we get it wrong and and people get the the value that they you know, that they're expecting, both the monetary value and also the impact that they were hoping to support. Thanks, Thanks. for that. Lead time, did you did you have a uh, did you have something to, to ask? Hi. Yeah, I got uh, questions. You're Lead coming in real muted. Very low. Oh. Uh, is this better? You're making a you're making a fool out of yourself. Okay, we'll come back to you, lead time. Please fix <laughs> your stuff. <laughs> Matthew, welcome. You have your hand up. Hey, thank you, Dumpling. I appreciate you letting me come up here and speak. I do enjoy your spaces. I think you bring together the right kinds of high quality people for high quality conversations. So thank you. Uh, I wanted to suggest a couple of solutions for the currency risk problem. You could definitely structure the smart contract or the, or the contract that's backing the NFTs to pay out in the local currency. I think one of the problems that Empower is looking to solve is this disconnection between the need for money and those who have the money. There's not a lack of local wealth in many of these countries. They just have a lacking functional financial system that does, enables the transfer of wealth from those who don't have it or those who do have it to those who don't in forms of loans and, and liquidity. So this could be a very good way to have locally denominated returns in local currency. And then you leave it to the, uh, to the token buyer or the investor to do their own currency hedging. That's one way to do it. Or you could also 
Um, you could also do currency hedging within the within the smart contract to be a little trickier. But I think if you want to think about these various series of tokens that are going to be distributed, you could do one that's you know, sort of locally funded from local local borrowers or local buyers, and then foreign buyers who want to have returns denominated in the in the foreign currency. It could also be used that way. So just a couple of suggestions for how to how to work on that cross currency risk, especially with um, you know inflation expectations are what they are, and experience has been what what it has been. But some people are willing to take that risk. So just a just a suggestion for the Empower team. Uh, th- thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, and uh, Matthew, I know you've been on a, a few of our AMAs, and uh, this is the kind of exactly why we also come on these AMAs. And in, in part, it's to of course tell the community what we're up to and what we're trying to achieve, but it's equal equally as much to try and get the community to give us that kind of feedback and to make connections and hopefully to continue these conversations after these AMAs um, and, and delve into these topics in more detail. So, you know, we've really been blown away by the community and the support it gave us in Catalyst and the support it's just given us in general in terms of getting behind our project. And so, again, on these AMAs, we always try and highlight the challenges, highlight what we're thinking. If somebody, you know, has good suggestions, please do reach out to us um, either in this form or if you're not comfortable, you can send us a DM and we can set up a separate time to chat more kind of offline, I suppose. Uh, and, and yeah, get get feedback like this and, 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 and give this to the right people with and our team to think about if those are maybe solutions. Uh, Lee, Tim, do you want to give it a second chance? Uh, I'm no, still I'm getting kind of a muffled vibe there, yeah. but uh, we have a, a, a question from the Discord, I believe it is here, that um, just came up. It says, can they mitigate currency devaluation by requiring the loan to be paid back in ADA or JED stablecoin? Also, are these all uncollateralized loans? So, so two parts to that. I mean, we can we can of course test the market with any offering, and so we could potentially say, you know, this is a US do- USD or US dollar denominated loan, and we can see who within our target audience is willing to to sign up for that, right? And so, in some markets, it absolutely won't be an issue, and in other markets, it might be. I think that's something we will will have to test, and we talk about testing both the nft product for the potential investor but also testing the end product for the tenant and ultimately homeowner you know and that's everything from how is the loan funded how's the loan paid back in which currency as you've touched on also how's the home built what kind of uh, sustainable f- features does it include etc so we'll have to test that of course um i think uh, the second question the first question was around the, the current hedge, but the second question... It was, uh, are these all uncollateralized yeah. loans? So these are these are lease, lease to own uh, homes. So the reality is that the home or the, the property itself remains, uh, the property developer, the property developer retains ownership of it until the lease, until the lease period is, is complete. So... Whilst it would not be our first course of action, of course, um, it would be very impactful if this was, but it, you know, if we follow due process and the person is still unable to continue to finance the home, there's, of course, the option to evict that person and bring in a new tenant um, to there who can then uh, re, you know, ultimately restart that process to, to owning the home once they've settled their full payment. So they're uncollateralized in the sense that Yes, the person won't have to put up any other collateral, but like a similar home, the home could be repossessed or could be they could be evicted if if they were unable to continue to make their payment. Scott Dow, you got a, a follow up to that? Yeah, so regardless of what currency we denominated in, we could put it in dollars or Bitcoin or gold or you know, whatever it is, the tenants are still earning their their income in the local currency. So if we say that the the rent is going to be 1000 USD a month and that's fairly stable if they're earning uh, something that gets a conversion of 1000 yeah. 
to one USD, and then the next week it's two thousand one and four thousand one. It doesn't really matter what we denominate it in, right? Like if they're earning in a local currency, it's always going to have that risk, right? Yes, of course, absolutely, that's true, right? So I mean, he the conversion whether it was like you said from uh, South African rand to EMP to dollars, etc. There are markets in South Africa, or some markets within Africa, where people do trade commonly with the dollar because there's little faith in the existing currency. The Zimbabwe, as an example, took on the US dollar as their official currency of tender um, a few years back. And then they're now playing around with some other currencies, but they definitely did take that on board. So again, it might be the case that a loan placed in US dollars might only be taken up by somebody who's working in the, in the market and is earning US dollars, which they will, which they, you know, potentially will be some some people who are interested who are in that position and that might be a far less risky in product and therefore have a lower rate of return than something that's denominated in in the local currency which might be more attractive to more people but obviously higher risk for the person doing the investment i think what will really it will really come down to and to to be clear this is not something that we know for sure today is in each market we will need to have a thought about what will appeal to that market, B, test probably different versions trying to achieve the same thing, and therefore, and then C, what the what actually works. And so that's why I didn't say Mozambique, we've started with four homes with the catalyst funding. Our next phase is 30 homes, you know, where we can learn a lot more from, and we'll slowly ramp up. It's not the case, I think we'll be able to go into a new market and do a thousand home development, you know, straight off the bat with, because we just simply won't know enough to do that. So it will always be a scaling up approach and unpacking the things that we don't know and that are relevant to that market. Thanks, Greg. And I also just want to say, I, I think what you guys are trying to do is great. You know, I think empowering yeah. people and, you know, giving access to housing, it's a great cause. Just uh, and not, not trying to give you guys a hard time, just trying to understand how this all works. Because w- when reading the white paper and looking at the website, just was uh, ha- having quite a bit of confusion. I, I look, we appreciate that. I mean, I think one of the things we, we keep advocating is that we're not a charity. And so we're a business and therefore we need business style questions. I think too often charities hide behind or NGOs hide behind the banner of being a charity and go oh you can't ask me this because I'm a charity right they don't have the, they feel like they don't have the same level of accountability or when you do ask them a question that is a, a tough question that they maybe don't have the perfect answer for they go well what are you trying to do you're not doing anything you know so you can't they feel like they're above criticism and that has left us in the position where we are now where a lot of charities are trying to or NGOs are trying to do really good work on the continent but haven't cracked the, the problem so we position ourselves as a as a business we think that's more sustainable from a business you know from longevity but it also means that we have to be able to think through and answer these kinds of questions if we want to be successful and by answering these kinds of questions we make a better product which means we're more likely to achieve our outcomes so we are we, we welcome these tough questions that's why we come on amas and especially amas like dumplings ama which we know is uh you know, filled with savvy, savvy crypto people who are going to ask us tough questions. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we what we signed up for. Awesome, thanks a lot, man. Cool, no problem. I don't know if uh, Dumpling was maybe having a little rugging issue herself. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to ask you a question that is kind of a little bit zoomed out from what we were just talking about, but you know, at a certain level, this project does seem to have land tokenization um, and property tokenization at its at its core. And I'm curious if you and your team have thought about kind of just those um, like supranational, uh, just, you know, these things go above certain state type um, organizations and have you thought about, you know, assuming this was successful, I feel like there could be some really um, scary lawsuits and and maybe, you know, because governments change and laws change. And how do you take that into account, you know, as you scale up and go into different areas of the world? Absolutely. I think, uh, to, to be clear, I mean, 
we kind of we've started this in Africa because that's a, a location close to our heart. But the amount of interest we've had from more developed or de- developed economies is is being eye opening. So I think you know this might be something that gets rolled out in markets that are way more developed with way more established currencies, crypto communities, uh, and property laws. So it doesn't have to be something that's always in a, an area that's as opaque as somewhere like Mozambique. When you say um, tokenization of land, do you mean bringing land ownership onto the blockchain or do you mean... Well, with the empowerment cards, right? Can you explain to us what Empower NFTs are and what's the difference between holding a token versus holding the NFT? Thank you. Maybe some more technical issues here, I think, maybe. Miggy, are you able to speak? Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just on mute. Okay, so so it's uh, the, the NFT represents your right to a return from the project that you invest in. So when you hold the, the impact card, it will promise you a return for a given period of time, and that might be a 10 to 15-year period, and that is how you're going to get a return. So you'll have your EMP, you'll buy your, your, your NFT. The NFT says, I, Greg, have financed you know, a develop, this development within Mozambique, and it's going to give me this return uh, each month, and it will have some other things maybe attached to it, a piece of artwork. Um, you know, there might be, uh, it might be very clear that it's only financing uh, homes for uh, female homeowners or sustainable homes that reach over a certain threshold. The EMP token is really there to be able to move the finances from where it's raised to where it's needed in an efficient way. And because of scarcity of that EMP token, and because that EMP token won't be needed to buy the impact cards, that part, that the value of that EMP token could go up and the value of the EMP token, of course, can always go down. Now, why would a person maybe hold an EMP token and not an NFT or vice versa? Well, the EMP token itself, beyond speculation of its price going up or down, can't be staked, can't produce a return. So you may hold it because you think it's going to go up, but it's also the most, the more liquid way of holding a stake in our project because you'll be able to go to any other decentralized exchanges we'll be listed on and ultimately the centralized exchanges we may be listed on and sell it immediately for your aid or your, you know, maybe they'll be a pain for US dollars or USDT or something. The NFT produces a return. So for those people who are looking to huddle for a longer period of time, it makes sense because they get in a return on, on, their, on their investment. But as with an ownership in any property class, it might be a little bit less liquid or it will, it will definitely be less liquid in the sense that you'll need to find somebody who wants to buy that NFT from you and there'll, there'll be a marketplace for that, but it might not sell as quickly. So ultimately, I think that's why both those two things exist. Some people may only want the NFT, some people may only want the EMP, some people may keep both in their portfolio um, at different ratios, but that's uh, that's maybe the uh, maybe broadly how we differentiate the two. Does that help, the dumpling? Yeah, thank you. Um, I do see Eric from Skatdao and Waifu. They have their hands up, so we'll go to Eric first, and then we we'll go to Waifu. Thanks, dumpling. So, who's issuing and creating these NFTs and selling them? So, so the NFT will be issued by ourselves um we did that with our founding community nft it was uh, minted by nft maker but i suppose as minting gets easier uh, we may use another provider or do it ourselves but we have a team who are both designing the nft so how everything that goes into designing it what the return could be uh what if what's going to be included with the nft for example the artwork if we think that's that we want to include, etc., and then our team will be designing it, and then ultimately we'll be minting it 
again, as I said, NFT maker did the last one, so they might do the next one again. Um, but that I can't, I can't confirm right now. I don't know, don't know which provider we'll use next. Sure, no, I uh, appreciate it. So if if it's your guys' team that's designing them and issuing them and deciding how much to sell them for, isn't that centralized control? Like, what what is decentralized about that process? If it's your you know small team that's making all these decisions and you know choosing what to sell them for and doing that, like, how is that a decentralized funding mechanism if it's controlled by the Empower team? Right now, right now, that is exactly how we're doing it, but it's not how we want the Empower marketplace to run longer term. So right now, we're, of course, in the proof of concept, in the early stages, and I suppose in the early stage of, of any startup, which is probably the best way to define us, or, start, or of any project, you do things that don't scale in order to be able to hopefully later do things that do. So our plan longer term, I may have touched on this earlier, but I, I, it probably wasn't clear enough, is for this to become a true marketplace where developers who you know have a, a project that they believe meets the, in, the empowered community's goals, right? So that wouldn't even be something that we necessarily set. We'll be able to put that up. They'll be able to connect with an NFT artist, designer, maker, develop that and take that to market and it might get funded and it might not get funded. Um, and that will be ready for the, for the empowered team more for the empowered community to decide. Right now, what I will say is, while it's not perfect, we do have a very vocal uh, and very trusted empowered community advisors or supporters, who basically people who have heard about our project, put up their hand and want to be involved in, in how we develop these things. Those are people who, are not, who volunteer their time, they're not compensated in, in any way. And we run everything past them, get the input. In some cases, they challenge us to make changes to things that we thought were were good, but you know they've highlighted there's been an issue. So if you go and look at our if you go and look at our um, roadmap, it is our intention. I think it is by the end of 2023 to have this be a decentralized marketplace where, as you mentioned, it then is truly decentralized. Unfortunately, right now. We've got too much, you know, we've got, we've got to find, show some proof of concept and that does require us to, you know, make some centralized decisions. Cool. I'll stay tuned and uh, see what you guys come up with. Uh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And also, I will say that uh, the DAO, uh, a DAO type structure is something we are obviously investigating. So again, if anyone on this call feels passionately about that topic or has strong opinions, of course, right now would be a good time to hear about it. But also, as always, you know, please reach out on Telegram, reach out on Discord, share that thinking either there or alternatively uh, ask to be connected with myself if I don't see your message. And I'd love to sit down with you and the relevant people from our team to get people's input. And this is not something we believe we can solve, just the core team that are working on this. Um, so... I guess I'll take my question now, if that's all right, uh, Dumpling? Yep, go ahead. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure. Um, I don't know if this was already answered or not, but you did hit on that if somebody owns an NFT, they will be getting a profit or some sorts. Um, now, with that being said, uh, from my understanding, that's considered an unregistered security in the U.S. So would there be a uh, prohibited uh, use for the U.S. to be able to uh, purchase these NFTs and make a profit of sorts? So, so what I can say, I mean, one of the things that's been really frustrating is, uh, is that for our token sale right now, we've had to in exclude uh, community members based in the US. Uh, we have a legal counsel who's a former member of the SEC, and that was advice that was provided by him. So it has been incredibly frustrating, and it's been frustrating for both our community members from the United States, but obviously for ourselves as well. We've got a, a strong following, and them not being able to participate in the token sale is of course not rewarding them for their, for, for kind of for their loyalty to the project. As far as the NFTs, the we're obviously looking at how they're structured and the and and they, there's a way that can maybe structured as mortgage finance. It's the the technicalities are maybe beyond 
my area of expertise within the project, but I can tell you that we are looking at how we can structure the NFTs so that they will be able to be sold to US-based investors. As I said, um, you know, given our legal counsel's SEC experience, we kind of taken his lead on it. But it, and, and of course, also the regulation within the states is also being clarified. You know, um, I suppose, and will hopefully be clarified sooner rather than later, so we can kind of work around that. But there's a lot of uncertainty there, and I, and I can't say for sure which version of our NFTs will be, be able to be sold, which won't. Uh, but it's something that we know we need to get right. Uh, I do know that uh, Phil recently mentioned that, like, from speaking to, uh, you know, the that exact uh, member, ex-member of uh, the SEC, that uh, obviously the, the uh, compliance advisor, you could say, uh, that it wouldn't be considered, uh, uh, that it could be considered a security, but that would also have to be something that we look into that as like, you know, uh, obviously, like he said, like uh, Greg was saying, trying to make it a uh, mortgage financing, which is obviously less stringent than if it was classified as security. But obviously it's something that's, you know, there's people on the team that are focused on that. So Phil primarily is someone who's, you know, more aware of that topic and he's speaking directly to that compliance uh, officer, you could say, or compliance advisor. So that that's something that is obviously kind of unclear right now because this isn't a model that's popular at the moment. Like you don't see a lot of NFTs for, you know, real estate financing, you know, especially kind of the niche area that Empower is going for, which is African affordable real estate financing. So it's like, yeah, it's kind of an un, undiscovered uh, area I feel like so yeah we're gonna have to keep our eyes out and see what's going on in America and over with the SEC and all of that I think does that answer your question uh okay. yes and uh, you still have your hand up do you have a follow-up to that no it was just a glitch great thank you uh, this is a very ruggy space today but Sincerely, thanks to everybody who is still in the space, helping out and answering questions and asking questions. I'm going to wrap this space up unless there's any additional questions. So final call before we board the airplane. No? Second time? Third time? No? Okay. I want to wrap up the space. So thank you all very much. Uh, great to hear from the Empower team. Clarify some issues and questions that the community have. And really especially the transparency, like Eric from Skatdao said, it's okay that uh, we don't have all the answers yet, uh, but it's important that we acknowledge that and reach out to the community uh, for help. And that's why we have those kind of spaces. The goal is not to, you know, approach projects and say, ha, gotcha. And, but the goal is to really help out and we can all figure out afterwards, you guys can have a private meeting or even an open meeting again in the spaces, in a space like this. So special thanks to 420, Waifu, and Eric from Skedal. Thank you guys for your very poignant questions and being respectful. And special thanks to Miggy, I believe, uh, Glenn, or was Greg and Phil, right? And thank you to Empower Team for joining to today's space. Really love the mission. Look forward to your progress. I uh, would love to hear from you again. So thank you, everybody. Look forward to seeing you in my next space in five days, going to talk to a muesli swap team. I would advise you have some milk with it because it goes very well with muesli. With that said, before we meet again, uh, take care. Don't lose your seed phrase. I'm going to take a vacation for a few days, trying to go to Twitter rehab. Uh, so I stop being too obsessed with Twitter, but let's see how that goes. If I If you don't hear back from me, that's because I'm trying to get rehab, okay? Thank you, everybody. Love you all. Talk to you Thanks, soon. Thanks, Amplin. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.